Good morning to each and every one of you, and thank you for visiting with us, by the way, some friends uh, this morning, and uh, those ones in the uh, sanctuary, in the hall, and at homes. Uh, thank you for joining uh, us this morning for worship service. As we have studied Acts chapter 2, we have learned that the beginning of Christian churches in Jerusalem was in fact a work, uh, the result of the work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of the first converts. They were pricked in their hearts. It's a quite interesting um, expression. They were pricked in their hearts. And the instrument of this inner work in their conscience was the preaching of the gospel of Christ. That's why Acts chapter 2 verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, Peter's preaching, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Of course, when the message was heard, the Spirit of God applied it to their hearts, which stirred them up to the extent that they could not be still without responding to the messages. The center of their thoughts, reason, emotions was pricked, and they became restless because they could not ease their inner beings to be calm. So they rushed to the apostles. We must be reminded that they were people who were either indifferent or unfriendly to the apostles in the first place. What changed them was the message of the gospel in their hearts, illuminated by the Spirit of God. Think of their crying words to the apostles. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? There was no pride, there was no arrogance, or there was no self-esteem of themselves, but only desperation for an answer. They wanted to know what they should do. They forgot that they had thought of the apostles before as only drunken men. They did not care about the apostles' accents any longer. We do know that Galilean accents were recognizable and they were associated with a low class, lowly class of people and the crucified Jesus. Matthew 26, 69 to 75 gives us an account of Peter's three betrayers against Jesus. And, and in verse 73, there is a very interesting uh, uh, incident happened. Here in verse 73, Matthew 26, Peter betrayed Jesus a third time. And the verse says, and after a while came unto him, they that stood by and said to Peter, surely thou also art one of them. So these people were able to recognize Peter as a part of a, a party of Jesus. It is because, it says, for because thy speech betrayeth thee. So Galilean accent must be very unique and distinguishable. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, the priests in general considered the apostles as unlearned and ignorant men. However, when the Spirit of God pricked the hearts of the first converts, they did not see their worthiness, but wretchedness. They submitted themselves to the authority of the message of the gospel preached by the apostles. It usually happens when the Spirit of God touches our hearts. He lets us see our unworthiness. He makes us totally broken men and women before him. The first converts did not see the apostles as ignorant, drunken, and uneducated men of Galilee anymore. All of the apostles' external representations were vanished away before the power and authority they had shown and demonstrated by their knowledge and preaching of Jesus Christ, the crucified one. So it all, everything began with the preaching of the gospel. First of all, the power of God's word that made all such changes in the hearts of its hearers. That, that part need to, needs to be uh, well um, uh, observed. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 is not a believer's persuasion, but to declare the power and purpose of God's word says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than to edge the sword. So the word of God is quick 
in other words, make the dead alive and powerful and sharper than the, any two-edged sword, the piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Greek word for quick is uh, translated as either living or alive in other translations. It is also understood that it has itself, in itself, energies of action. What it indicates is that the word of God does not simply exist, but is continually living with energy and power. Therefore, once in a while, you may want to check how you receive God's word, whether it really works in your heart. It could be well compared with 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. In other words, the main instrument that the channel God uses to make our dead souls be alive is God's word. Being, being born again, regeneration or rebirth is coming out of the powerful work of God's word. The power of God's word is found in the power of making dead souls to be alive. It brings life against the death. This word of God lives and abides forever. So word of God is not just needed for rebirth, but also for continuing Christian living. It means that God's word is necessary for us both to be born again and to be sustained as the children of God. It is supposed to live in us continually, forever. The sustaining and per, a per, a persevering grace comes with the power of God's word because it lives and abides forever in us. It provides both an answer for the reasons of our spiritual backsliding and a solution for spiritual restoration. It is hard to know exactly when we begin to experience spiritual backsliding, but it is not too hard to, to know when we begin to lose our desire to know and to study God's word. Spiritual backsliding and the losing desires to know God's word are always going together side by side. It is uh, something like a parable found in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. The which, when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof, goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. In other words, when a man is found such a treasure somewhere, then whatever he has, he sells everything in order to buy this so that he can get bigger, uh, worthy ones uh, for his possession. Likewise, if we know that the word of God is a treasure to us, then we shall invest everything we have in order to acquire it. Therefore, if someone says, I really love God's word, but there is no effort to learn the scriptures, to meditate upon God's word, then that person's confession is it's only a lip service. We give our efforts to take time to read the Bible and to join Bible studies and meditate upon God's word. It requires a discipline against our natural inclinations. There is no spiritual giant or spiritual revival where there is no holy agitation by the word of God. If you have ever prayed for any kind of revival in your personal or private or public uh, Christian life, for revival, if you have ever prayed for revival, then I think there should have, uh, uh, have been shown or demonstrated the desire um, or strong appetite for God's word. We begin to neglect regular scripture reading and to forsake opportunities to study it. The word of God, according to Hebrews 4.12, does energize its recipients by its piercing power. The Greek word for powerful in Acts, um, Hebrews 4.12 is energes. You can guess from which, um, what English word uh, was uh, born out. This word is associated with our English uh, word energy, obviously. And it is also translated as active or effective. Therefore, if the word of God is being heard by you, 
but there is no energizing effect in your heart, then I think there is something that you need to examine your own souls and your relationship, personal relationship with God. It is supposed to be active and effective. It has to be powerful in your hearts. Thus, the ones who are under the ministry of God's word cannot be spiritually lethargic or inactive. Their thoughts are constantly influenced by the work of the word of God, which brings them to repentance, correction, edification, and activeness toward the work of God. That's why Christian churches must be full of apostolic doctrines, the teachings of God's word. The opposite experiences may be felt when we are not fed on God's word. We feed ourselves with our own thoughts or someone else on biblical and on, on spiritual ideas, and we become whining, complaining on spiritual and even humanistic believers whose thoughts are not different from the thoughts of the people in the world. That's why when you have any spiritual questions or dilemmas in life, if you are looking for a counselor, do not go after someone who seems to be intelligent and wise, but go to somebody whose wisdom is coming from God's word. Those ones who are neglecting the word of God are not adequately qualified to give spiritual advices to you. Sometimes I, I think that is a main problem. Some, some believers in Christian churches are going through some tough times and they are trying to find answers for their questions. And very unfortunately, they are going to someone who does not really understand the biblical wisdom, who does not know the Bible. There is no fear of God in that person, but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, beginning of knowledge. It was precisely the problem of the rebellious children of Israel. Their lips were near to God, but their hearts were far away from him, and they were totally ignorant of God's word. People do not hear God's word, not because they can't, but because they do not want to. In the heart of the converted, the word of God is uniquely ministered on the day of Pentecost and afterwards, continually. There were a couple of unique effects of the ministry of the word in their hearts. First, the preaching of the word of God offended them with direct confrontations. God's word did not just speak to them for comforts but provoked and agitated them and convicted them that they were wrong. The gospel was very, very confrontational. Gospel does not begin with something like, um, you are born because uh, God loves you and you are destined to be loved by God. And uh, it is okay, whoever you are, whatever you have been doing. That is not the, the case, gospel message presentation. The gospel was very, very confrontational. It, there is an offense in the gospel. It was very offensive. According to Paul's words, the gospel message of Christ is only foolishness to them whose souls are not enlightened, but probably very intelligent. In their minds, the gospel is just a foolish. The world, by wisdom, cannot know God. However, it pleased God by the foolishness of a preaching to save them that believe. Did you hear that? The foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Thus, the preaching of the gospel cannot but be a stumbling block or an offense to the minds of the unconverted. The gospel challenges their understanding, their intellect, and ability to judge themselves. And their unconverted minds cannot but say that the gospel is not acceptable because it's foolish. The first converts confronted this reality of the gospel, gospel offense, and were convicted by it that they were wrong. Thus, they were pricked in their hearts. When the Spirit of God works through the preaching of the gospel, there is conviction of sin that leads the hearers to repentance. For example, Acts chapter 2, verse 23 says, Him, Christ, being delivered by the determinate counsel and for knowledge of God, ye, you, have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. From this short verse, we can find many offenses to the hearers 
in Jerusalem, like they were against the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, or they corroborated with the wicked ones, or they were the real murderers and the slayers of Jesus. They could not blame the Romans. They thought they were righteous and Jesus was unrighteous, but in fact, everything was wrong on their part. The gospel is not a cosmetic to beautify the unpleasant, but the surgical mess to operate the deadly diseases. The preaching of the gospel made them taste both bitterness and sweetness. When they heard Peter's message of Christ, they were totally despondent and cried to the apostles, what shall we do? They saw themselves as wretched sinners and knew that they were unable to deliver themselves from their misery. On the other hand, verse 41 testifies that they received the apostolic exaltations with gladness of heart to repent of their sins and to be baptized in the name of Jesus. The gospel of Christ produces godly sorrow and by which we taste the bitterness of sin and guilt. And it also offers us solutions to taste the sweetness of forgiveness and everlasting life. The preaching of God's word is necessary to change our minds or perspectives or our worldview. Peter is a Jewish audience on the day of Pentecost did not hear him because they thought they needed the new teachings from Peter. They did not come to hear him preaching because they thought they were wrong and needed apostolic lessons. What changed their mind and thoughts was not their own desire or desire for insight, but the preaching of the apostle Peter. They did not know that they were sinners until they heard preaching. They did not know that the crucified Jesus was their savior. They did not come to hear Peter to change their minds or second opinions. Rather, the Peter's preaching enlightened their minds and helped them see their wrongs and the necessity to repent of their sins. In this Pentecostal event, Peter's preaching edified their faith. They believed in God and their faith carried lots of impurities because of lack of right contents. The preaching of God's word purifies and strengthens their faith. The preaching of God's word is not just for conversion, but for continuing growth. The first converts did not stop hearing God's word after their conversion, but they continued in the apostles' doctrines. So Acts 2, verse 42a says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and so on. The King James Bible says it well in this translation by saying they continued steadfastly. The NASB reflects the aspect of continuance in its translation well by saying, and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship. Their continuing devotion to learn of the scriptures does show three practical suggestions to us. Number one, we ought to make up our minds to study the Bible. Continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine literally means they adhered with strength to the scriptures. It does not come by naturally. Without any effort, there has to be a commitment. We cannot devote ourselves to study the Bible without a determined will. Well, if I want to do it, I, want, I will do it. Well, you must have seen, you must have experienced in your Christian living, by the way, if you just leave the Bible somewhere and you have a desire to read it, but one day just you skip reading the scriptures and second day easily passes by and on and on until next Sunday when you come to church. It is so easy for you to leave the scriptures on the shelf and never really touch it until you come to church again. Bible study requires your determined will. It's a, it's a matter of will. Can I remind you once again? It is a matter of your will. Determination, willingness, devotion, 
It is not a natural inclination for us to read the Bible and to meditate upon it. And so continuation is the key. Number two, we ought to come to the Bible teaching and the study sessions. The only converts were gathered together to teach, to learn, and to study God's word. They did it despite all inconveniences and even dangers of gatherings. They could be easily identified by unfriendly crowd when they are coming to the Bible studies. It is always hard to set a certain time a day or a week aside to devote ourselves to the scriptures, but the early Christians did it. For example, from pastoral point of view, I regard Wednesday Bible study and prayer meetings as important. It is, it is really, it gives us the strength of uh, our our church is a spiritual uh, tone. However, I know that someday even Wednesday meetings will disappear and um, it will be found only in historical accounts in the church history books or a legend because there are not many parents joining prayer meetings and Bible studies by their choice today. And their children see and know it. Their parents are not joining Bible studies, Wednesday Bible studies and prayer meetings. So they have grown up without knowing Wednesday Christian gatherings in Christian churches. So they understand that Wednesday gatherings are unnecessary. In their children's generation, Wednesday meetings will be only in memory of practice of the past. Children have not seen their parents devote themselves to the scriptures, which is most families, Christian education at homes. Only Christians took a different stand. Despite all the inconveniences, despite all the dangers, they were willing to take the risk to come and to join others for Bible studies and prayer meetings. And third, we ought to teach and learn. The Lord gave the apostles to early Christians and appointed the teachers and pastors to teach his people from his word. The apostles taught and the people attended at the gatherings faithfully. And secondly, now we move on to the next point. The early Christians, the first converts in Jerusalem, continued in fellowship. And I think this is an interesting part. I'm going to deal with it a little bit today. And probably in the subsequent message, I'm going to add some more points to uh, the lessons I'm going to give you today. Acts 4, verse 20, 42. Would you like to read verse 42? For verse 42 together. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Amen. The first word, the, first of all, the word fellowship. The word, in spite of its all abuses, is still a beautiful and meaningful word for Christians. When rightly understood, it means the same as the word of communion. That is, the act of and condition of sharing together in some common blessing by numbers of persons. The communion of saints then means an intimate and loving sharing together of certain spiritual blessings by persons who are on an equal footing before the blessing in which they share. This fellowship must include every member of the Church of God from Pentecost to this present moment and on to the end of the age. Now, before there can be communion, there must be union, obviously. It is evil to divide the believers by a partisan spirit unless the truth is at stake, unless some actions have to be taken. The shadows are one, in a sense, altogether, above organization, above nationality, or race, or denominations. That oneness is a divine thing achieved by the Holy Spirit in the act of regeneration, 
Whosoever is born of God is one with everyone else who is born of God too. We must pay attention to that. There is only one subject and one verb in the sentence, verse 42, that demonstrates the attitude of the believers in all the church. So in verse 42, if you look at the verse carefully, the subject is they, referring to the believers. And the verb is continued steadfastly, referring to their devotion and perseverance. Once again, if you look at the verse very carefully, the same subject, the same verb make up a sentence with a fellowship as well as apostles' uh, doctrine. It makes this sentence say, they continued steadfastly in fellowship. What do you think? The fellowship is not just treated casually, but very seriously. Only Christian churches that devoted themselves to continually uh, to fellowship. In other words, the believers made a conscious effort to fellowship with the fellow believers in the same way. Determine the will, willingness, or if we borrow words from modern translations, this verse says they devoted themselves to fellowship. I wonder whether this teaching is pricking somebody's heart today. They did not think that fellowship with one another was a choice or option, but an obligated privilege. That was the attitude of the first converts in Jerusalem. Hence, we must be noticed that when a believer wants to be alone, leave me alone, or prefers isolation to integration with the fellow believers, he may not experience a healthy growth because that is not the way that God is purposed for the believers. He is out of place by placing himself out of the fellowship with the saints. The fellowship of the saints is a reflection of a true churches. It is because this fellowship is with all the members of the church with each other as well as with the apostles. It is because the believers are one spiritual body inwardly by faith in Christ and outwardly by confessing Christ, receiving the apostles teaching and being baptized publicly. There are members, many members in one body. Thus, they are interrelated and interconnected. They are supposed to be connected, not isolated. It is because the believers keep themselves together as one body and treated each other accordingly. As they have one faith and one teaching, so they make up one body in one fellowship. There should not be any parties or schisms. Thus, our attitude toward the fellowship with the saints could be a good measurement to measure of our faith and spiritual maturity. Surprisingly, our spiritual, spirituality can be measured not by just an amount of knowledge we may have of the scriptures, but uh, the intensity, the level of our Christian fellowship. It is because no mature believers will say to the body of Christ to leave them alone. It is clearly evidenced in Acts chapter 2, verse 44a, which says, all that believed were together. It is also supported by Acts chapter 2, verse 46a, which says, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, continuing daily with one accord. The Greek word for one accord is also translated as together by the ESV and NIV, while as one mind by the NASB. I need to point it out that the Greek word for continuing in verse 46, verse uh, the first part of verse 46 is the same word we find them, find it from um, verse 42a, continue to steadfastly, and they are the same uh, word. 
Fellowship with the saints is a necessity for church life. Not only public church life, but your personal and private spiritual life. You need it, and we need it. Let me quote John MacArthur's comments on fellowship from his commentary on the book of Acts. He says, in quote, for a Christian to fail to participate in the life of a local church is inexcusable. In fact, those who choose to isolate themselves are disobedient to the direct command of scripture. The Bible does not envision the Christian life as one lived apart from other believers. All members of the universal church, the body of Christ, are to be actively and intimately involved in local assemblies, end of quote. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 is a very well-known passage. It says, let us together, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exalting one another, and so much the more as he see the day approaching. The Westminster Confession of Faith also talks about Christian communion. Uh, chapter 26 of the communion of the saints. In fact, this confession is a part of the confession of faith. The fellowship of the saints, that's a part of confession of faith. Have you ever thought of it? Whenever we think of the confession of faith, we tend to think about doctrines only. But in fact, the fellowship is a part of our confession. Chapter 26, Article 1 says, in quote, All saints that are united to Jesus Christ, their head by his spirit and by faith, have fellowship with him in his grace, suffering, death, resurrection, and glory, and being united to one another in love. They have a communion in each other's gifts and graces and are obliged to the performance of such duties, public and private, as do conduce to their mutual good, both in the inward and outward man. End of quote. That's just a part of the confession um, shown under the heading of the communion of the saints. Therefore, if you have not actively really committed to promote a Christian fellowship, actually you are betraying your own confession of faith. The fellowship of the saints also includes sharing and giving. The most common expression of fellowship in the, in the New Testament is that of sharing financial resources, giving in other words. For example, Romans chapter 12 verse 13 says, Romans 12, 13 says, distributing to the necessity of saints. Would you like to turn your Bibles to Romans 12, 13? I want you to read it. Okay, let's uh, read it together. Distributing given to hospitality. I mean, it's just a simple verse. The word distributing is coming from the word fellowship. And it is also translated as contributing in NASB or contribute ESV and share in NIV. Distributing to the necessity of saints. What are you going to distributing to the necessity of saints? Your financial um, assistance. We are naturally inclined to be selfish. We want to have more and more and more. The problem of the greed is that it does not know the end. So how much is enough to satisfy your soul? And someone, you know, a few, about a week ago, I read the newspaper, um, uh, the news coming from one particular country, and the government officer was, um, was a very corrupt, and so he was executed uh, based on his corruption charge. And the collected, the money, collected money from his home um, for briberies or whatever corruption was weighed up to three tons. I don't know how much it may be. If you have cash money 
for three tons. How much money is that? I think if he had just one percent out of three tons, he could be very well off. But why? That that is the nature of human greed. It is not a natural thing for us to contribute, distribute what we have to the necessity of the saints. That's why it is being exalted. That is a communion of saints. That is a fellowship of saints. So part of it, we are giving to the missions, for example, an agape fund. And all of those things are a part of fellowship. In Galatians 6, 6, I love this verse. Why don't you turn your Bibles to Galatians 6, 6. Okay, let's read it together. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Amen. So I, I really love it. Do you believe that? Because this, this verse says, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. So in other words, if I just simplify and uh, give you a new version, modern translation, that means something like this. Uh, you communicate good things with me. Are you upset? The ones who are being taught with the word of God must be able to share or communicate the good things with him. That's what this verse is talking about. Here, communicate is from the word of fellowship. And all major translations use the word share for fellowship. Then I expect that a lot of good things are coming out of you. I hope all of us to understand what I'm trying to say. Sharing, communicating. And um, maybe this is a good reminder, you know, just in case if you can remember uh, someone in the past who shared the gospel message with you. It is important for you to remember the person in prayers. If the person is in, in needs, maybe it is an opportunity for you to share something with that person as he shared the gospel with you. Philippians chapter 4, verse 15, reflects the same thought. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Out of so many congregations that Paul ministered to, only Philippian congregation uniquely, contributed toward his needs. No church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but he only. That shows that not all Christian communi communities are generous and gracious, even to the fellow um, ministers. In that regard, I think uh, Hope Church has been exceptionally kind and hospitable and good, and I hope that we'll continue uh, to do it. We can do even more. This thought is expanded in Acts chapter 2, verses 44 and 45. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. So that was the attitude of Christians uh, in early Christian churches. The fellowship of the saints is a part of our confession of faith. The fellowship of the saints has been a part of the confession of faith of the believers. I'm not sure how many of you have, have been able to recite the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed, the last part of the Apostles' Creed says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, which means universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. So right after confessing of the universal church of Christ, the communion of saints is confessed. The word communion is koinonia in Greek, which is translated as fellowship in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. That was, the, that was the confession. The only Christians under the fire of persecutions driven from place to place, sometimes deprived of the opportunity for careful instruction in the faith, 
wanted a rule which should sum up all that they must believe to assure their everlasting welfare. Out of this critical need arose creeds, the creeds. Of the way, of the many, the Apostles' Creed is the best known and best loved and has been reverently repeated by the largest number of the believers through the centuries. It was written about the middle of the fifth century and for millions of good men, that creed contains the essential of faith. Not all truths to be sure, but the heart of all truth. It served in trying days as a kind of secret password that instantly united men to each other when passed from lip to lip, lip by the followers of the Lamb. It is fair to say then that the truth shared by saints in the apostolic fellowship is the same truth which is outlined for convenience in the Apostles' Creed. Fellowship, sharing. In fact, uh, Myung and I have been uh, traveling around to visit different churches and we have met different uh, you know, congregations and different individuals from those congregations. And um, one family uh, built a new house in, uh, not too far away from the city of Atlanta. And uh, the family said, the pastor and the sister Myung, you can retire in the States if you want to. And we are building our kind of retirement home and it will have three different layers. And we are going to let you stay in a whole unit. In one, once, one whole uh, floor, it will be you, uh, yours and it's a perfect house for you. Well, we have a very good friend in, in South, uh, South uh, Carolina. And when she built, the family built a house, they built a room in such a way that whenever we come, that, that uh, place could be used for, for our stay. An ensuite room is uh, ready for us. So if we go though, to those places, we, we know that we have a place to stay. Well, it is because of their Christian love and they valued our ministry and our fellowship with them so much so that they prepared the place for us. That is the heart. That is the spirit that each and every one of us must have. Only Christian churches, they suffered so much, but they were willing to do everything for fellowship. And it was a part of the confession of faith. I hope that when you are going to confess your faith, you will be able to say it loudly, convince, convincingly, because you do it and you believe it. It would be difficult, if not altogether impossible for us at this late date to know exactly what was in the minds of the church of fathers who introduced the words into the creed. But in the book of Acts, we have a description of the first Christian communion in chapter 2, verses 41 and 42. The fellowship of the saints implies that all believers belong to one body and they need each other. They and we and all redeemed men and women of whatever age or clime are included in the universal fellowship of Christ and together compose a royal priesthood on holy nation or peculiar people who enjoy a common but blessed communion of saints. We belong to each other. The spiritual welfare of each one is or should be the loving concern of all the rest. We should pray for an enlargement of soul to receive into our hearts all of God's people, whatever their race, color, or church affiliation. Our fellowship does not have to be restricted only to those who live in our own times. The prayerful reading of some of the great spiritual classics of the centuries would benefit us greatly. It is a form of extended fellowship beyond our own age. By strengthening the rest of the body, actually, we ourselves can be strengthened. The fellowship of the saints is a necessity for them to keep and maintain their spiritual vitality. Any real work of God in our hearts will tend to unfit us for the world's fellowship. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 
if any man love the world, the love of the, the love of the Father is not in him. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? It may be stated unequivocally that any spirit that permits compromise with the world is a false spirit. The pain of loneliness arises from the constitution of our nature. God made us for each other. The desire for human companionship is completely natural and right. The loneliness of the Christian results from his walk with God in an ungodly world. A walk that must often take him away from the fellowship uh, of good Christians as well as from that of the unregenerate world. His God-given instincts cry out for companionship with others of his kind, others who can understand his longings, his aspirations, his absorption, absorption in the love of Christ. And because within his circle of friends, there are so few who share his inner experiences, he's forced to walk alone. The unsatisfied longings of the prophets for human understanding caused them to cry out in their complaint. And even our Lord himself suffered in the same way. No one really was able to understand him. Every redeemed soul is born out of the same spiritual life as every other redeemed soul and partakes of the divine nature in exactly the same manner. Each one is thus made a member of the Christian community and a sharer in everything which that community enjoys. The fellowship of the saints is also a fellowship of truth. The inclusiveness of the fellowship must always be held along with the exclusiveness of it. Act 2, 20, uh, 42 verse A once again says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. So truth brings into its gracious circle all who admit and accept the Bible as a source of all truth and the Son of God as the Savior of man. The truth makes man free and the truth will bind and loose, will open and shut without respect of persons. Second Corinthians 6.14 says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Hebrews 12 verse 14 declares that no man shall see the Lord without holiness. Simply being together is not a fellowship. There needs to be a sign of holiness and its growth in it. In the personal level, if there is no growth in holiness, then God is not working in our life. The first two outstanding characteristics of all the Christians are continually, number one, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, and number two, devoting themselves to Christian fellowship. And I hope that uh, all of our hopers are willing to open their homes for fellowship, for the Bible study. God has given us such a wonderful and beautiful homes, houses, so many rooms. When I was growing up, my family was poor and we had only one bedroom for a whole family and a small kitchen and that's it. Sometimes we rented one room in a house and we were not allowed to use the living room. So one bedroom and one kitchen, that was all we had. We were having a wonderful time, and I have good memories. I'm sure that there was some pain and suffering uh, along the way, but it was wonderful. But how many rooms do we have in our homes? You know, sometimes our living room itself could be far bigger than some of the homes in the overseas we have ever visited. Open the homes. Share what you have with other people. Open homes for lonely people. Or... Contribute to those, those ones who are poor and um, lonely. And I hope that uh, younger ones in, in, in our midst will be able to greet our seniors after the services rather than you just pass them by 
without recognizing them, Christian fellowship, and the senior members will be able, able to, um, you know, recognize those young ones. I hope that the parents with the little ones, they will bring those little ones to the senior members of our church and greet them. And that is the way that we can educate them um, in the Christian way. And, and also, that is the way that we can nurture them with good manner and um, a good uh, Christian uh, family sort of environment. That is a good thing. These are two continuing in the apostles' teachings and Christian fellowship. They are like lifelines of the believers after convergence. The babies in Christ need to continually feed on the truths of the scriptures and grow through the fellowship of the fellow believers. Through the scriptures, you will be able to learn how to think. And your worldviews and values, perspectives will be changed. You will see it. But until you get it, you do not know it. And there is a difference between spiritual maturity and immaturity. On the other hand, the Church of Christ must be able to provide, of course, the teachings of the scriptures and to promote the Christian fellowship. From individual believers' point of view, they must be willingly and consciously committed to do it. While churches should provide all the encouragements and opportunities to satisfy their needs. Christians ought to devote themselves to the teachings of the scriptures and to the fellowship with their fellow believers. And I hope that um, we will practice it. You know what? Um, in, in our church, I really desire to see that our male leadership will be well cultivated and nurtured. Unfortunately, I do not have too many um, candidates because there are not too many people who are consistently studying the scriptures with me. And just like in times of Deborah, when men is not able to take up the male leadership, then female leadership will have to step in, which is not going to be a blessing to the whole community as a whole, because God has designed males, men, be challenged, be serious about the things of God. And I hope that you will step in. And the Christian fellowship is important. Let us open our hearts first. And let, let us open our homes uh, and um, Opportunities will be given to those ones who need a fellowship. And also, fellowship cannot depend on one particular person or one particular family. Everyone must go together and work together. And uh, there has to be a thanks and gratitude, a proper attitude shown to the people who have been sacrificially communicating the things with us. And I hope that uh, we'll be able to talk about this fellowship part a little bit more in our uh, next message. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, though the first converts in Jerusalem did have their unique, challenging situations and historical um, uh, backgrounds, Lord, but uh, they were really committing themselves to study the apostles' doctrines and also to Christian fellowship. Dear gracious Lord, as we are longing for really spiritual revival and also restoration of first generation Christian churches in our midst. Father, help us to have the same sort of commitment in our hearts, in our lives, in our church. Help us to devote ourselves to meditate and study God's word and to Christian fellowship. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.